Good morning or good evening from wherever you are. This is Regina Yao, the founder and president of the Pixel Project. And you are watching one of my installments of the Pixel Review Launch Google Hangout Sessions. Today we have two really, really special guests. One is Jacqueline Friedman, who is the founder and executive director of Women Action Media and the editor of Yes Means Yes. And the other is Soraya Shamali, and she is a writer, activist, and feminist who writes really excellent articles about violence against women in the media and online. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. Yeah. So today, we're going to be talking about um, what, what what's brought this Google Hangout together today is Soraya and Jacqueline founded the FB Rape campaign. Um, and they push because Facebook has had a history of turning a blind eye to images and language that is violent towards women or depicts violence against women and they don't they did not seem to take it seriously until the FB rape campaign came along so today we're going to be talking about online violence against women and what we can do about it so I think the first the natural question to start off with of Soraya would be what's happening with the FB rape campaign right now? We have ongoing conversations with Facebook that, um, mm -hmm. pursuant to the agreement that we came to at the end of the campaign last May. So one of the things that happened when we closed our campaign was that Facebook set up a, a mechanism whereby uh, people could report in through WAM if there were questions or concerns or content that they had reported that was not being taken down. Uh, so we still have that mechanism in place. We also sort of regularly contact them when problems are brought to our attention personally and we're working with them in an ongoing way to try and ensure that the conversation continues, that people are trained um, and that the issues that we still feel are outstanding are, are being addressed thoughtfully. Okay. Jacqueline, do, do you have anything to add to that? No, no that was pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what would be, what, what if we were wondering was, you know, the Pixel Project, because we, because we primarily do online campaigning, was, what would be the, what do you think the next step would be after the FB rate campaign? Because that was a spectacular success in terms of mobilizing people to hold social media, uh, social media companies and maybe other online spaces to account for you know keeping their spaces safe for everyone including women and children so what do you guys think are would be the next step because Twitter reacted pretty quickly when it came to you know uh, Carolyn Criado Perez's case uh, but it's reactionary right they should have had something in place beforehand they should have been more proactive so what do you think would be the next step for companies or people running online spaces, whether it's social media, whether it's forums, whether it's blogs, to make sure that the space remains safe, that, that you know, it, I've come to think of online spaces as almost pa as parallel to real life spaces, public spaces. So, you know, as as we all know, you know, we do have an issue with women in public spaces uh, having being harassed in public spaces. So uh, online harassment is almost equivalent of that, but sometimes it can be it can get even worse. So what do you think would be some of the solutions we can look at? Well, I think that we have to back up a little. I'm not sure that I agree that platforms, uh, social media platforms like Twitter, can be proactive. You know, when you've got I don't know how many 11 tweets are going, right? That um, I think a lot of these platforms are going to have to rely to a certain extent on reporting mechanisms once offensive content is brought to their attention. I think the larger question, the conversation that we've sort of begun to have with Facebook and that we really need to be having about all our platforms is really piercing the myth of a neutral platform. You know, we hear right. from a lot of places who are resistant to the idea that uh, speech that promotes violence against women is hate speech, you know, or and needs to be reined in and need to be punishments for it. 
um, that they don't want to interrupt a neutral platform. They want to have a neutral platform. But we know that what we actually have is the tyranny of structurelessness, right? And that if you have a platform that treats all people as having equal standing in society, when in fact all people don't have equal standing in society, um, then the people who already have the power and privilege to speak are going to be the people who get to speak the loudest. Um, so if you, if, if the, when these spaces, and we see this over and over again, imagine that sort of having a hands-off policy around speech um, gives them a neutral platform. What it does is gives them a platform that provides cover for the bullies and you know, in fact leaves women, people of color, and trans people, mm -hmm. the people who are often marginalized in public spaces, very vulnerable. And that's not a neutral platform. That's a platform that votes for the bullies. Um, so I think that what we have to make clear to all of these platforms is you have to choose, because not choosing is still taking side. Yeah. Right. I, I agree. I, I think the idea that there's anything like neutral objectivity in these environments is just wrong and it's misleading because the default is always going to support a status quo social structure. And that's true whether it's online or offline. And so I think that it needs to happen on all fronts, right? It has to happen on the streets, it has to happen in the courts, it has to happen online. And that constant push against uh, notions of speech that are intrinsically discriminatory has to happen simultaneously. Yeah. So, so basically, do you think that online spaces, the way things have been going there with you know, like Jacqueline says, it, you know, the, the guy, under the guise of neutrality, they, they provide cover for people to bully others. Um, do you think that online spaces uh, amplify what's happening on the street offline? I think the internet is like gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think that it... Um, it amplifies all of our best impulses as human beings and our worst ones, you know? Like, it just makes everything more. And so it has a marvelous ability for, you know, this conversation to be happening, right? For example, we're all in three very different places, and people who are yeah. tuning in are tuning in from all over, and that's amazing, right? And it really mm -hmm. amplifies our ability to organize for women and against violence. Um, and at the same time, it amplifies the violence itself. So people sort of think about, you know, is the internet good or bad? And I just, I really just think it's gasoline on everything. Yeah, and but I, you know, I think that the potential, the, the thing about the internet, of course, is that we don't have soapboxes on street corners anymore. It doesn't work that way. And so I think to your point, the potential for the amplification of harm is much higher, and that has implications for privacy and reputation and all of the things that before had kind of limited scope. Now there's no limit to the scope. Oh yeah, and it's and basically anything you do online, you leave, you leave a digital footprint. So you know, I, I was just wondering the other day. I was just thinking, I was like, well, if we all leave a digital footprint. Um, with you know trails of emails, trails of conversations, chats, and all, and you know, can love them. Yeah, you know, why? Why do you know? I just wonder. You know, if if abuse is happening in real life, and it all, sometimes it turns into he says she says situation, or once I say something, the other says the other thing. There's no concrete trail, um, but online there is. But why do you think? It's so difficult for so many governments and so many law enforcement agencies to just prosecute online harassment and bullying and all, you know, especially against women and minorities because that it's right there. It's right there in black and white. It's there in videos. It's all captured. Why do you think it? You know, we, you would think that it would make. Yeah, you know, it'll make the job of law enforcement easier because there's all these... Well, it does in some instances, right? Like we, s mm -hmm. we saw in the, very famously in the Steubenville case that if there hadn't been that video, I doubt we'd have seen a conviction in the Steubenville case, right? And that video yeah. existed and was people were aware of it because of social media. Um, so I, I think that there are cases where it does. I think that a lot of law enforcement is run by 
older white guys, at least here in the U.S., um, who um, aren't as in touch with how online media works. And I tend to not think about it as online versus real life. I think it's really important, actually, and I think it will be a breakthrough for law enforcement when they start treating online as part of our real lives, right? As though it's this imaginary thing that we don't need to worry about. Um, but so, but but what? But I think that they don't know. Like they're like, what is Facebook? What is Twitter? Like a lot of them aren't on these platforms. You know, Instagram and Snapchat. Like they right. don't know. Um, and so they look at this and they're like, this looks like a plaything for children, and I'm not that interested. And then there, I think there are also some real issues of jurisdiction that have yes yet to be worked out. Right. So I think part of it is, you know, if I'm in Boston and I'm being harassed by someone in. Germany, for example, or even New York, right? Like, who's who has jurisdiction over that? And, and those are real legal issues that have to be worked out. So I think there are some real structural challenges, and then there's also that sort of mental shift that, like, we need to... We need to educate law enforcement that this is real life and that it matters whether or not someone feels free to speak on Twitter. Um, and that's a big leap. That's a big shift, and it may take a generation. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to be that patient, but it may take that generation. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know, that there's no denying that the same kind of um, offline trivialization of harm related to things like stalking mm -hmm. migrates online too, right? So it's taken a long time to even get the notion of stalking to be taken seriously, and it still isn't in many instances, right? I mean, there it's very, very difficult for our legal system and for our police um, systems to deal with stalking. The same thing happens online. So first, as Jacqueline said, there is the there's the fact that there are police officers that when they're called they say, well, what's Twitter? Because they're not using it, right? And yeah. then that's compounded by the real and legitimate minimization of harm that we recognize, right? Because our law recognizes gendered harms, so physical violence, not emotional violence, for example. And the things that women experience online very often involve anxiety, um, self-censorship of speech, um, and, and other things that the law really struggles to recognize in general. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you talk about, you know, anxiety and self-censorship of speech and all, and um, I might be wrong, but I think all this online violence against women has been around for a pretty long time but only in recent years maybe the last five years that we've suddenly had the media pick up and and talk about high-profile cases like mm -hmm. Anita Sarkeesian and um, and Carolyn Criado Perez mm -hmm. and in England and the UK they're starting to take it pretty seriously uh, but in the end it, it still was a patchy sort of uh, Caroline's case was a kind of had a patchy ending and she's now off Twitter. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking about how Jacqueline said how law enforcement and and um, legally, you know, it's still all, you know, whose jurisdiction, whose jurisdiction does this belong in and all. So, you know, I don't want us to speculate, but what do you think would be a good first step for law enforcement, for governments to Start. To, what's the first constructive step that they can take to address this? Because, like you said, online is borderless in a way. It's borderless. So, what do you think is the first good constructive step that they can take to start really addressing this? Well, I mean, I think locally, because of the jurisdictional issues Jacqueline's talking about, you can only really start where you are, and mm -hmm. as individuals, right? Or an organization, for example, that's not massive and global and transnational and has resources. I think it's really important to be talking to people who have authority to challenge these things or to police these things and have them understand a different perspective than the law has usually taken per everything we've talked about. And so there's one aspect which is, you know, get up to speed on the technology if at all possible. But the other aspect, again, is to talk about androcentrism in the law, not necessarily using that language, but talking about <laughs> perspectives and, and impacts, because it has a real impact on people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. And and to 
to have that become part of the culture that it is not right now. I mean, it, it just generally speaking is not part of the culture to be recognizing street harassment, online harassment, stalking, whether it's virtual or in, real, in the real world. I just think that we need to take a step back from this idea that there is this distinction between the two, as Jacqueline said, and treat them almost equivalently in terms of their their um, constraints on people's lives. I also think um, we have to see it as a feedback loop, the sort of culture and the and the sort of justice systems, the various interlocking justice systems. You know, we know we've seen studies that have shown, for example, that. Um, the negative victim blaming press after here in the states, God, over 10 years ago now, there was a very famous rape case, rape allegations against a basketball player here, Kobe Bryant. Um, he was acquitted, but there were a lot of myths perpetrated by the media about, you know, she was asking for it, why would she go up to his room if she didn't want it, you know, all of that stuff that we're all, those of us probably who are tuning into this are, are accustomed to, talk, to hearing about. And that we know that perpetrating those myths has an impact on whether victims report, whether perpetrators self-identify their actions as crimes, but also on judges and juries and prosecutors and, you know, all, all the people who make up the court systems who are part of the culture. Um, and so I really, that, that's to sort of build on Soraya's idea. Like, I think that we... I think that even though it winds up being played out in law enforcement and in, in justice systems, I think that we, I think the real fix is going to be the cultural change fix. Um, I also think that we need yeah, more, I agree. Women, more women in the, in the justice systems, right? Like I think part of the issue is the odds are if you're reporting any of this, you're report and, or if there's a judge sitting in on it or whatever, it's, it's a guy. Um, and some guys are great. There have been individual instances where, you know, I have a friend who is being targeted online, just a, a torrent of hate coming at her uh, from some MRAs um, who, uh, you know, talked to the FBI who, and she found someone. She just lucked into somebody who was very helpful, actually. Um, but that's, it shouldn't be luck, right? It shouldn't be systemic. And in order to get it to be systemic, we really, we actually are really going to have to change the culture. I wish there was, I'm open yeah. to there being a quicker fix than that. I'd love to hear it, but that's, that's what it looks like from here. Yeah, I mean, change seems to take such a long time, right? And you mentioned more women, we would need more women in, you know, the judicial system and law enforcement system. And what, do you think if we had more women in tech companies, especially tech companies that, uh, do social media apps, smartphone apps, and all, and who you know, companies who who tech companies who make products that facilitate communication and and sharing and reaching out to people. Do you think if we had more women in those companies, running those companies that, and working in those companies, not just a head, you know, like Marissa Mayer, um, not just someone who's heading a company, but overall more gender, more more women working in those companies as programmers, engineers, policy makers, that we might see a change in how companies and organizations treat online violence against women. Oh, almost certainly. Almost certainly. Because if you're the only woman in the room, or even if you're one of 20%, right, if you're in a real minority, you're, you're not going to feel empowered to speak up about this stuff. You're going to feel like you have to constantly prove that you can roll with the boys, right? Um, only when we achieve, achieve real parity do women feel safe sort of bringing up their experiences. And we know that, um, that that really does change the workplace. It really opens up different conversations. Um, you know, when I, getting back to the idea of this sort of neutral platform, I, I think the reason that argument, the sort of inherent bias in that argument is invisible to the people who are making it is because it seems neutral to them, right? Like if you're a, a white guy in tech, a straight white guy in tech, it, it's neutral for you, right? <laughs> it doesn't have any bad ramifications right. for you. Um, and so having people in place who not only can see the, the disproportionate, uneven impact of those hands-off policies on women and other marginalized communities, um, having those people not only in the room, but in the room in enough numbers that they feel empowered to really make the arguments, that's what's going to take to shift the culture from the inside of these companies, absolutely. 
Right. I, I will say th there is something interesting about what Jacqueline and I and Laura experienced, um, which I think is replicated in lots of different places. And um, I think this happens not just at Facebook, but in many different scenarios. When, when we first started that campaign and when we have conversations like this, this idea that women constitute a group, a class, is very hard for some people. And so when Jacqueline, for example, just said women and other marginalized groups, that's exactly right because we are marginalized even though we make up more than 50% of the population, right? But other, other marginalized groups, many of them have dedicated organizations that focus on specific aspects of their identities. So for example, there's an LGBTQ organization, there's a Muslim American organization, there's the um, Anti-Defamation League that focuses on anti-Semitism. And what happens in all those equations is that there's no one organization whose major thrust is women or violence against women or online misogyny. And none of those organizations themselves has the resources to focus on the needs that are quite specific to women within the categories that they are focused on. And so women as a class that is identifiable as sharing this kind of violence fall through the cracks. And there aren't enough resources. There's not, not that kind of focus. And so when you say misogyny is an issue, there's this hole. It's like, um, what is the name of that book? All of the feminists are white and all of the African Americans are black and some of us are brave, are, are men and some of us are brave. There's a gap there, right? And women fall into that gap. And so these organizations also tend to be seriously male dominated as well. And if you say, well, I am a Jewish woman or I am uh, a Muslim woman or I am um, a lesbian, sometimes that, that just doesn't, it, it has the same level of marginalization within the area that's being focused on, if that makes sense. And so, you know, when I've gotten in touch with the Southern Poverty Law Center to talk to them about various issues, and there's just no focal point. There's, there is nothing that's focused, no, no one organization that has this as its uh, reason for being. Yeah, I mean, the Pixel Project is, you know, we focus on violence against women, and what we found is that, you know, we get a, we, we get a lot of feedback from, you know, especially men, you know, not being sexist here, because we, we, you know, part of our part of our mission is to reach out to men and to get them on board as allies and to you know, give good men uh, ways to um, ways to get ways to help the cause. And you know, because all our campaigns are online, so they have many ways of doing so, like with music and film and all that. And then we we broadcast it online. We share the music online and all. And the amount of flag we get, I mean, we get the you know, well, women are violent too, and you know, and stuff like you know, it, no, uh, you know, we get you, you know the drill, right? They'll start saying, well. You know, women aren't the only ones who experience domestic violence. Never mind the statistics that say one in four women in most countries. In some countries, it's one in three women, one in two women who experience domestic violence um, or rape. They say, oh, men get raped too. You know, it, we keep getting that sort of pushback in all our campaigns online. We get flamed on Twitter. I mean, the first time we started our, our Twitter, our Twitter program, you know, round the clock round-the-clock headlines, round-the-clock headlines. We get, we got flamed so much, and I think, I think the reason why people, why women might not have that sort of special interest group, and I, I don't really like to call us a special interest group, but in right. a way we are, is because we're, like you say, we, we have about 51 percent of the global population, just over, just over half, and because we're not visibly a minority because we are half of the human race, people don't tend to see us as a special interest group or don't tend to see us as a group that needs to be to get organized for our rights. 
because we have right. it, numerically we have. So it well, is. I think what, yeah. What's interesting about I mean, what was interesting is what was interesting in our conversations with Facebook is I think when Facebook would say women and other special interest groups, my response was the only special interest group we should be talking about really are white men in this equation <laughs> because they are actually a special interest group, right? I mean, uh -huh. it's an identifiable, fairly small, given the global population, um, cohort that has this power in these institutions. And so that is really the special interest group that we should talk about. And that's what I try and do when people say, when they use the word special interest group, right? Because we just don't think in those terms. It's very hard to invert that. But that is a special interest group, and it's a legitimate conversation to have when I think we are having these kinds of conversations about institutions and changing them. Well, and I would also say, like, we don't have to negate the fact that men can be and are raped, right? Like, that men right. can be victims of domestic violence in order to say that as a social phenomenon, these are gendered phenomena, right? Like, the, right. I think it's important to have that message, right? To say, like, yes, people of all genders, including women, perpetrate rape. And people of all genders, including men, can be raped, right? Yeah. But when we look at the predominance of who's doing the raping and who's being raped, it's a very gendered phenomenon. And so, right. um, you know, sure, yeah, absolutely men are raped. You know, men are victims of domestic mm -hmm. violence. Men get nasty things yelled at them online when they speak. But um, if you look at patterns, if you look at it as a social phenomenon, it's quite gendered. And and it, it does us good, I think, to be allies, you know, and to say, like, yeah, and it's equally bad when men are raped. <laughs> absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're, what we're here talking about here is a social phenomenon. Yeah, they, they, they seem to get really angry, you know, when, when we say we focus on women, but that's not because we don't acknowledge that it happens to all genders. That, you that's know the, the interesting the thing. That, if, if it's the they that I'm thinking about, mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's the they that I'm guessing it is, like, what are they doing for male victims of rape, right? Yeah, that's, that's um, the question, right? What are they doing? If they're putting all their energy to it, Attacking us for doing something for our, you know, doing something for women. What are they doing about it? That, that's the question we keep asking. And most of the time, what they're doing is actually making it harder for male victims to to report as well. Um, you know, so I think that we can be allies, right? Like, if you're really mm -hmm. concerned about male victims of rape, and we're really concerned about working on violence against women, let's be allies and work together. In the, and that's kind of my response. Um, you know, we don't all have to specialize right. in everything. And that's clearly happening. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely happens. It, we know um, there's a, right. oh, God, the great prison organization. I, Just Detention International, is that the name of it? I don't know if I got it right, but there's a really great organization that's doing work on rape in prison, and they got a really fantastic law passed here in the U.S., and... Um, you know, I've you know I've had numerous conversations with them. I consider them an ally, and and I think they would say the same. Um, you know, the folks who are doing the real work, who are concerned about male rape, are, are not offended by talking about also violence as a gendered phenomenon. Yeah, it's it's going back to talking about online violence against women. It, it's you know for people who deny it that that women get treated differently online. I will tell you something really interesting. Um, Bell by Jow, Breakthrough and the Pixel Project had a Twitter, had a Twitter thon, had a Twitter chat online, tweet chat, and uh, we we chose cyber violence against women as that month's uh, that month's topic. Oh my goodness, the people were really you know we got so many participants. It was one of the biggest tweet chats ever. It was trending, you know, cyber war. Well, it was trending as a hashtag, and the number of women who reported, you know, I can't write my blog anymore about women's right. issues or my issues because I keep getting the tro these trolls. And then someone from India said, well, when a man expresses his opinion about politics, it's just his opinion. When I express my opinion about politics. Um, it seems that I don't have a, the right to be there, and sh I get shut down. So, you know, what do we have to do to 
get these, as, as Jackie said, these white men <laughs> to realize that it is really gendered out there in online spaces. I don't know that I'm that interested in getting them to realize anything. I think I'm get, I'm interested in getting there to be consequences, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the, the white men can show up or they can not show up. Like, that's on them. Um, I'd like to see um, organizing so that when women are being targeted online, especially in sort of organized attacks, um, you know, not like one person said something to you, but like, you know, there's that deluge. Um, you know, not all of them, in fact, I would say most of the time when that happens, it doesn't make the news, right? It's not Anita Sarkeesian or, or anybody else. It's like women who have it. Ha I get sort of back channel to me because, it, because I've spoken out about these issues, St all kinds of stories that would raise the hair on the back of your neck and they don't make anybody's headlines. And um, I'd love for there to be a system where, you know, like a bat signal where, you know, somebody to work with that woman and say like, here are the different ways you can respond to this, here are the different pros and cons, you know, you have to decide because, you know, taking on your trolls can have a different effect and may have risks that ignoring them doesn't, but ignoring also has risks to your mental health and to also not, you know, et cetera. You understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we need to stop trying to convince the white men and start just taking it into our own hands, if yeah. I'm being perfectly honest. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> not, it, it's not just white men, though, because, like, when, when I mentioned the tweet chat, it's, you know, women, the Indian women, you know, joining in and saying, we get shut down when talking about Indian politics, you know, and it, it just... But it, it is. I we think didn't we have to track yeah. it. I mean, and, and I think you know, in the same way that Hollaback has tracked uh, street harassment, you know, in the streets, um, that if we were able to track it in a way that it wouldn't require individual women sort of putting their neck out, but that we would get data right. about how often it happens and what it looks like, that might be a really interesting project to sort of start to make it visible. Because there's so much gender. invisible stuff. Can I, I, I just want to go back to Soraya, when, when, when you and I, when we started the FB rape campaign, when we were, when you and me and Laura Bates were just yeah. talking about it, um, one of the things that came up was like the last group of women who had taken on this issue um, had been doxxed. And for those right. who don't know what that word means, it means um, that they had had their private information published, I think, up to including like their kids' names or pictures. Oh, or yeah. Really where they were, their stuff, where they were. Um, and you know, Soraya and Laura and I spent like an entire weekend locking down our data, and so there are real costs to trying to be a woman who tries to get stuff done on the internet, even if you do it right. Like you know, I'm I've developed a pretty thick hide at this point, right? I get the hate mail, and um, mm -hmm. you know, I categorize it and sometimes I laugh at it and sometimes it shakes me and I keep going one way or the other, right? Um, but even so, there are real costs um, and, and I have an institution behind me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what I really worry about are those women who are invisible, right, who don't make the headlines, um, but who for right. one reason or other, so there was this case in, I forget exactly where it was, but there was a case this fall where there was a mistaken identity thing where the men's rights activists came after this one woman who they thought was a rape survivor who had spoken out in some way they found displeasing. And she wasn't even the woman they thought she was. And they were like ruining right. her life to the fact that I, I think that she had to like pull out of school temporarily. Like, um, and she, you know, she's not a, I don't know if she was a feminist activist or not. She was just going about her day, right? She literally had not even tried to engage. Um, and so I think that making those invisible cases more visible is a place to start thinking about that. Yeah. You know, that's interesting because did you see what happened um, with the Dartmouth Rape Guide? Um, I saw that it got a lot of press. I don't, I don't see what, what, what else happened. But that was a case where here was a young woman who, who was not in any way engaged online publicly. Her name is listed in this rape guide. She is then subsequently raped on campus, um, and in between, because her name was in this guide, she became the target of excessively misogynistic communications. Right. Online, focused on her, directed at her, that then moved obviously offline into her, her everyday life. Um, 
And I think I, I think there are a couple of things that we're maybe conflating. There's public people like us who who are targeted because we're speaking out loud, right? We're we're breaking all of the rules about the ritual silencing of women, right? We just refuse to sh shut up. And then there are the women who actually do incur that cost of silencing, right? And they they stop writing about certain topics, they don't speak in public, they close their blogs, and a lot of them lose their source of income or, or valuable assets that accrue from the kind of work that they can do in public. Or to um, Adria that, Richards with Dong. Yeah, Gold. like yeah. Adria Richards, right? And and that's one category, but some of the silenced people, the people who really don't know where to go, which frankly overwhelm me sometimes because like Jacqueline and I, I'm sure Regina like you, people contact me um, and I don't even have an institution behind me, right? I, I would like to be able to help them, but the fact that they're even contacting me just to me shows how desperate they are for any help because institutions are failing them, right? And when institutions fail on such a broad basis, on such a systemic basis, you would think that we'd identify that as a society and do something about it, but that has not happened still. And so, you know, even when, when Jacqueline's saying if we could put it on a map, I know that Gender IT has a map where people can go and they can pinpoint where they've experienced the harassment um, and, and describe what that harassment is. But I still go back to this idea that there's no dedicated resource that is tracking, following, monitoring, or providing resources for many women that we never hear about who just see the ground. You know, they, they experience these things as trauma and they just stop engaging. And they weren't, and some of them, as we were discussing, weren't even engaging to begin with. Right? At all. They weren't engaging at all. That's right. They weren't engaging at all, right? That's like even a third category. Yeah. It's like women. They're just kind of going about their business and get blindsided by something. Yeah. You know, I think it is actually this weird morphing of that asking for it myth, right? Like, there's this idea yeah. that all of the women who are targeted, I think because the famous or the more famous cases are activists who are really sticking their necks out, right? Um, that the idea right. that women who get harassed and targeted out online are already doing something controversial and what did they expect, right? Um, and and one of the things that I'd like to that I really want to make more plain is like there is not just the same way as there, there's nothing that you can do to prevent someone from raping you you know from being in the room with some or at least someone trying to rape you um, there's nothing you can actually do to to sort of prevent being cyber harassed you know you can just be in the wrong place at the wrong time oh yeah I mean we what's interesting is. Like, right, so right, you, you guys just gave me an idea because the Pixel Project does, all, you know, almost solely online campaigns. You know, we may, depending on funding, I think this is something that we may decide to take on in the future. Like you talk about tracking, tracking right. instances of cyber harassment of women, providing resources. Right now, we're not in a position to do that. But what's interesting is we we started looking. At it. We started including articles. You know, we do write articles, we do publish articles on our blog and all. And we do a campaign called 16 for 16 um, for the 16 days of activism every year. And last year, we actually published an article which has which uh, gives people 16 ideas of how people who are members of online communities can come together to stop cyber harassment when they see it. I think half of the battle, part of, part of the battle would be to get people to recognize that it is harassment, that this is happening, that, you know, that gaslighting, to recognize gaslighting online and to recognize that it can escalate. So what's also interesting is when I had, we had the White Ribbon Campaign, um, White Ribbon Campaign uh, Google Hangout last week, one uh, one of them actually said that he's the social media manager and he said he sees all this cyber violence against women, you know, harassment, gaslighting, um, pushing women out of spaces. But as a man, he, he, had, he did say, he said, but I have no idea how to effectively address that when I see to, to do bystander intervention because it's, I think, 
when you see some some a woman being harassed on the street, most people know like stepping in or, or addressing addressing the harasser. Uh, if you go in not just alone but with another person or as a crowd to address the harasser, then there's social pressure for the harasser to stop. But online, people seem to be kind. Of, people they're good people out there. They just don't know what to do. Well, but I so think you have, have to be careful, idea. right? I think there are real risks. You know, if, if a, a woman's being harassed online, there are a lot of questions I would ask. And But the very first one would be, what does she wish you would do, right? Like, it may be that she's intentionally using an ignore strategy, and she does not want you to intervene because it's right. just going to escalate the situation, right? I would not, in fact, encourage on digital bystanders to intervene on behalf of a woman who's being harassed online without checking in with that woman. My guess is if you're seeing it happen in public, there's a way to check in with her, um, you know, whether that's tweeting at her or, you know, wh whatever the format is. So the number one thing you have to do is put the, the victim in control um, because there are real ramifications and, and she may or may not want things to escalate. Maybe what she just wants is for people to say nice and supportive things to her while she figures out how to ignore what to do, right? There's a number of different ways. So I think that confusion is real and the advice that I would give is check, say, I see that this is happening. Would you like some help? What form would you like that help to be? Yeah, I, I think, too, that this notion of constantly sharing information and educating the public is super important, um, especially, especially when it comes to issues like intervening or what bystanders can do. And, you know, it's interesting. Susan Benish, who's done a lot of work on what she calls harmful speech as opposed to hate speech, right, speech that harms, by changing the language around abusive speech, I think automatically you can make people pause and think because when somebody hurls an intrinsically misogynistic uh, word at a woman with the intention to silence her, that's the only intention, right? When they do that, they're already violating all the principles that free speech is meant to uphold. So the free speech, their ideas of free speech have nothing to do with what they're actually doing in the first place. But a lot of those people, when they are confronted in a way that makes them pause, when somebody says, and it's really simple, I think she calls it the, what would your mother think test? When you actually say, would you say that to your mother? Or what would you like me to share that with your mother? They actually stop and apologize or stop and say, oh, I didn't think about that. Or it's really quite simple. It's like a really small, simple mechanism that seems to be very effective when it's been tested. Um, and I find that fascinating because I remember, I think last year there was a really funny text chain going around um, oh, yeah. after a man <laughs> sent a woman um, pictures of himself naked and so she sent them to his mother and he just couldn't believe that she sent them to his mother. It should be he said, literally reverted to being a five-year-old. Pictures, yes. Remember that? And so, but I, yes. I think that that getting people to think in terms of harm, not hate, um, mm -hmm. harm, not um, sexism necessarily because that word is just too much for some people. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think they're empathetic to begin with, but they can be made to think differently about the speech they're using. So basically you're saying reframing. Reframing might help. Yeah, might I would say them. reframing. Yeah, reframing because like you said, um, the word sexism, anything that, you know, uh, you know, this is for another, probably for another discussion, but anything, any phrase, any term that it's vaguely feminist theory seems to. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> that's right. So you know, it, it, a it's funny story. When um when Jessica Valenti and I were talking to our publisher about titles for subtitles for Yes Means Yes for our anthology, um we sent like a list of five suggested subtitles, and the publisher sent them back, and they all had the phrase rape culture in them, and the publisher sent them back and was like try sending us ones that do not use the phrase rape, rape culture, um, which was hard. You know, it's now visions of female sexual power in a world without rape, which I love. Um, but it took us a while to get there. And, um, and I think it was correct in terms of getting people to pick up the book. Once you right. say rape culture, like, 
Mm -hmm. Like, people just will not engage. Yeah. yeah it, you lose the audience that you actually need to talk to. Oh, yeah. You know, speaking of audience, I'd like to tell everybody who's watching right now that the Q&A app is open. So if you have any questions, we have another 10 minutes left. We'll, we'll keep chatting, but if you have any questions, just type it in, and we'll do our best to answer it. Hopefully. But yeah, I mean, with the Pixel Project, we, we do a lot of reframing. Because we wanna, we want, we wanna be inclusive. We don't, you know, we want men and boys to, of all different cultures to come on board. Uh, they are not violent, they, but they can't see, you know, they, they don't have a way to help. So we want them to see here that we are giving you some channels, some ideas on how you can get on board to help. But it took a lot of reframing. It took a lot of you know, we are in this together, you know, we are not, you know, we're, we're not going to berate you, we're not, you know, here, we're focused on the solution, here's what you can do together with us. So, yeah, but it's true, you know, reframing, you know, I, I have so much respect, so much respect for, you know, all the feminists who came before us, all the women who fought who fought for us to have the vote in so many different countries and cultures, all the women who fought for uh, us to have the right to go back out to work, uh, you know, all the women who fought for all reproductive rights and all, but when it comes to talking to the lay person on the street, sometimes it doesn't even matter if it's what gender the person is. E reframing is so important, and I think online, because as Jacqueline said, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's like gasoline. So if you put one phrase wrong, that's what we find. For you, just phrase something in a way that is perceived incorrectly, not the way we, not not what as what we mean. It explodes. We've had that before. It was uncomfortable, but it taught us that reframing is, as Jacqueline said, it takes a while to get there. Absolutely. Yep. But it's worth it if it works. It, it, it works. It does. I mean, Jack, Jacqueline, apart from the title of your book, how have you reframed, have, over the years, how have you reframed the way you present your points? Um, I, gosh, I, I tend to leave terms behind. So instead, instead of talking about rape culture, I talk about social license to operate. Um, which is a it means the exact same thing as a sociological term, um, but it has sort of a more neutral sound to it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is an idea that I got from uh, uh, Thomas Miller, who uh, is a contributor to Yes Means Yes, who's really in, and does all the blogging for us at Yes Means Yes. Um, I I tend to think I mean I think that it's not so much you know I could go into particular instances, but I more have developed empathy, right, that for a lot of people who aren't immersed in these ideas, we're asking them not only to reframe, but to recognize that they're in a frame to begin with, right? Like, they think that what they believe and what they've come to understand is just true, not framed in any way, right? It's like saying to someone, have you considered there's something you could breathe other than air, right? <laughs> like, um, you know... No, <laughs> like, no, that's never a thing that we think about. And so I think we have to, um, I know I was all sort of radical and like, screw the white men, let's just take it under our own hands. And, and I do feel like that some, sometimes too. I, I think we maybe have to do both things at the same time or, or some of us have to do one thing and some of us have to do the other. But I think when we are trying to work with people who are new to the ideas that we're presenting, you have to really understand what a stretch you're asking them to make. You're asking them not just to imagine a new idea, but to imagine that the, the idea that they've been living with as truth was framed for them in the first place, right? It's not just inherently true. And it's very destabilizing. People don't like to change. I mean, none right. of us do. It's <laughs> part of human nature. Well, and I think it's hard, too, because we're all complicit, right? I mean, we all live in these systems together, and... Um, we 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 are individuals that are in these social networks that 
Op, you know, we we never nobody operates in isolation, and so even the best intended people can be doing things and have relationships and work in ways that undermine their own intent, right? And it's just because many people fall back on a lack of time, no real interest. They're not involved the way we are. Um, they have traditions that they love, and a lot of what we're talking about requires people to confront not just big ideas outside of their homes, but their interpersonal relationships with parents and with siblings and with children. And that's super complicated and very scary for a lot of people. Um, and I think that, you know, as Jacqueline said, you, you need, we need to be able to empathize when we ask people to empathize, because we are asking them to empathize and if we don't put ourselves in their shoes, it just won't work. Yeah, I mean, coming from someone from a traditional conservative culture, I see what you both mean. I mean, it, it, the transition is so painful. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I, I, I see firsthand. It was. My dad is gonna be seventy soon, and it is so painful for him. <laughs> it, you know, I, I must have spent you know my entire since I could talk. You know, maybe the last thirty something years. It, 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 just educating my dad. I love my dad. I do. He's a good man, you know. But tr you know, just educate. I mean, he had to get the baptism of fire because his daughter learned all these new things, and then you know, the way I behave changed. So the way we relate changed. So it is difficult for him. So I, and you know, working in the Pixel Project, it's like trying to get people through online communities where ideas spread like wildfire to change, trying to trigger that change, it's more difficult than a lot of people think. But we well, are... And that, uh, yeah. that one on one relationship you have with your dad and the fact that you love him is actually a real strength in this work. And I, and I think that, you know, our conversations online and our media, they all play a role, but there's no substitute for those one on one conversations and having them over and over again. You know, I, I really do think that, um, you know, I, I think about sort of cultural change work or sort of like changing a person's point of view is sort of like planting a seed. It's kind of like gardening, right? So like you may the per be the person, unless it's somebody you have this ongoing lo re loving relationship with like your dad, you may just get to be the person who happens to drop a seed in the soil, right? Somebody else may have to come along and water it, right? Somebody else has to be the sunshine and you're probably not going to be there when it blossoms, right? And we And I think part of the frustration of this work is like not only do people not like to change, but people definitely don't like to change in front of you. Like, it's going to be pretty rare for somebody to hear an argument that they've never heard before that they're really resistant to because they think what they already believe is true. And they've been, nobody likes to hear, like, oh, every, the whole way I've been operating is not only incorrect, but immoral, right? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> I totally agree you know, with you now. I, I see what you're saying. And, my life has been a mistake, right? Like, um, that's a pretty private, and we're probably not going to see it. We very rarely get to see that moment of change, and it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And I think yeah. that we have to. One of the things that those of us in the work can do is just remind each other of that. <laughs> I mean, I I saw the change. I mean, last year, I think, for the first time ever, and I nearly fell off my chair. I was telling my dad about something, and you know that he obviously made a mistake. And normally he would just, you know, bluster and go off. And that's my dad, you know, because he's he's very taciturn. He said, "You have a point." <laughs> I nearly <laughs> fell off my chair. You have a point. I nearly fell off my chair. I'm that's so right. proud of my dad. Okay. You know, think of the years and years and years it took to get to you have a point, right? Like when we're working with people who aren't our loved ones, like we only get a moment of interaction a lot of the time. Yeah. So, but, but you know, I think I think it's important. Um, I often think of these personal relationships when I'm writing, um, and I really try and write with humor because of it, right? One of the ways that we can engage people is with humor and I think it's important because sometimes this work is so very dark I mean it's just dark and ugly and um, it's important not to bludgeon people and 
no pun intended. But I really <laughs> think sometimes. Sorry, I, it's. I really think sometimes that, you know, because we have this focus, it's constant, right? It's unrelenting. You're talking about rape, or you're talking about domestic violence, and it's not pleasant. And there's nothing fun about it, you know. Um, but sometimes, if you can have conversations around these topics that are funny um, without making the subject the target of a joke, for example, right? Um, it can lead to some very interesting epiphanies in the way people can change their perspectives. And that's, I think, what we're really after in these moments that are elusive um, and difficult. Yeah. Well, we're coming up to the end of the hour, so I'm going to trot out the little slide. I don't think you guys have seen this slide yet. It's a cute little slide and um, it's just to take a cue from you saying that we need to do, you, you, we need to approach it in a positive way with some humor. Um, what the Pixel Project has been doing for the last two years is by encouraging people. We have, a, we have a project called People and Pets Say No because, you know, pets also bear the brunt of domestic abuse. So what we've been doing is getting people and photographers to send in um, statement pictures with them and their dogs or their cats or their goldfish or whatever pets they have and we're holding up a sign saying we say no with their names and and um, and their countries on it. So I'm going to play this slide um, and it's also a little shout out for the Pixel Reveal campaign because we're getting men on board and we're trying to raise a million dollars for the Pixel Project and the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And here we go. Hopefully this works. <laughs> screen share. Yay. Start screen share. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 See? Yes. Uh, you have all these people. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. They look, you know, and, and basically it, this is the second picture it took. So they also held up the sign saying, buy pixels, change lives, because we're getting people to um, donate a dollar a pixel to reveal um, four different male role models underneath. And we have like a Pulitzer Prize winner, we have a Nobel laureate, we have an environmentalist. And basically you just go to http uh, slash slash reveal dot the pixel project dot net because, you know, the pixel project wants everyone to take part because we believe it's time to stop violence against women together and it doesn't matter what your gender is, it doesn't matter where you live, we can all do something about it. And yeah, so basically, yeah, we, we've been doing this because we find that there are different ways of um, different ways of getting people to engage and one of the most effective ways actually is through their pets because people love their pets. People, people love want their pets. People love their pets, and, and, and you know, you know, Soraya, you were talking about humor, and I've been to some of these photo shoots with people bringing their pets in to hold out the sign and have their picture taken. You should see the smiles. You should see people <laughs> laughing, and their dog. You know, so there's always one dog that yeah. always breaks loose and starts running like a mad canine across the park with half the humans chasing after it and you know and, and they start getting more positively disposed towards the cause they start asking questions about you know what can I do um, what programs do you have um, or they say well my mom got beat up when I was little and I didn't know what to do and wh what can I say now and yeah you do have a point and then online as well you know we have people like the vlog brothers have you seen the recent, do you know the Vlog Brothers, um, Hank Green and John Green? No. They have this massive, they do something called Project for Awesome, which is every at, at the end of every year on YouTube where they get people to make videos um, supporting their, supporting the, the, you know, their favorite charity, giving, telling people why other people should support their charity. And they raised about, last year they raised $800,000 from their wow. community, the YouTube wow. community. And some of that money actually went to places like Rain um, and, you know, other, other non-profits that, that impact um, 
that impact uh, women and girls. But what's interesting is recently they, they, they did a video, and I will email it to the both of you because I don't have the original video to show here. Um, they recently found out that some YouTube music artists, one YouTube music artist in particular, um, had an abusive relationship with a fan. He was 22 and she was 15. Um, and they spoke out about it and they made a video about consent and almost half a million people have viewed it. So, you know, it... That's they great. Com yeah, they combine... They, they basically combine entertainment with education. So, I think if we can sort of get people, more people to do that, I think that would be great. So, do you guys have any last words before before we sign off? Thanks so any much for words? having us. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, because I only I talk to you guys on email. You know, I only see <laughs> what you write online on Facebook and email. And you know, we should do this another time because I think there are a lot of topics that need that have come up actually during this Google Hangout that needs to be addressed more in depth and maybe we could get White Ribbon and all to join in. So thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you please, so much, Regina. Yeah, please um, go to the uh, HTTP colon slash slash reveal dot the pixel project dot net to check out check out not just the, the not just the fundraiser but also a bunch of videos of men including Michael Bolton, the Grammy Award winner, talking about the importance of male role models. This is Regina signing out together with Soraya and Jacqueline. Thanks. <laughs>